Okay. Hello, everyone. We are so excited that you're joining us today. It is going to be an absolutely incredibly dynamic conversation. We have Dr. Frank Lippman from Be Well, and his insight and expertise as a practicing physician in New York City truly is unparalleled. He's been ahead of his time on this. And then joining him is also Ken Cook, the founder of the Environmental Working Group, who, again, was very much ahead of his time. Both of these men have been extraordinary friends for over a decade. I have leaned on their work so many different times uh, for so many different reasons, which we'll get into as, as we begin this discussion. But I really want to thank everybody for taking some time this afternoon to join us. We're really excited that you're here and we're going to be kicking off a very interesting conversation because as many of you know, so many families today are struggling with autoimmune disease, with conditions, diseases like never before. The staggering rates of things like cancer that are now expected to hit one in two men and one in three women in the United States. According to the Centers for Disease Control, cancer is now the leading cause of death by disease in American children under the age of 15. And these are just data and numbers that hit you in your heart. And we're seeing it every day. You know, we're contacted by friends or family that are suddenly diagnosed with breast cancer. They're dealing with a rare cancer in a child. And then on top of that, we've just got runaway rates of obesity. We've got runaway rates of diabetes. 70% of the country now is either overweight or obese. And really, you know, we're seeing this in our families, but we may not necessarily be seeing it in the headlines. And as we talk about things like autoimmune disease, we're also realizing that one in 13 kids now has food allergies, one in 10 has asthma, the rates of autism are skyrocketing. And you know, you'll sometimes say, oh, well, you know, we're just, we're, in, we're, we're diagnosing it differently or things are changing. And that is flat out not true. When you think back to the 1980s, when the movie Rain Man came out, starring Dustin Hoffman, we had never seen autism. It was so novel that the movie was just this incredible sensation and this lens into this world. And today, an increasing number of American children are being hit with this condition and families everywhere are asking why. Why are we seeing an increase in autoimmune disease? Why are we seeing such an incredible uptick in things like cancer? And so that's the conversation today. Not only are we gonna get into the why, but we're also gonna get into the what you can do about it. How can you exercise precaution what preventative measures can you take to not only protect your health, but the health of the people that you love? Because ultimately that is what this is all about. And to me, it is one of the most patriotic things that we could be doing right now is protecting the health of our families because ultimately that protects so many things in our country, our economy, our military, our education, our innovation, so much. So we're gonna kick it off with Dr. Frank Lippman because I think what he can speak to is what he is seeing clinically in his offices every day. And as he'll share, it is a really different story to what he saw 10 years ago. So Dr. Lippman, would you like to kick it off? Oh yeah, Frank, Robin. Anyway, it's uh, fantastic to be with both Robin and Ken, two of my favorite people, two people doing unbelievable work in this uh, arena. So thank you both for all the work you do. So yeah, I'm going to talk about the clinical experience because in the last 10, maybe a little bit longer, but definitely in the last 10 years, I'm seeing more and more young women in particular coming in with these chronic autoimmune problems. Now, this is a huge problem which we weren't seeing 10, 15 years ago. So why are all these young people, you should not be getting sick when you're young, coming in and, and they're really sick. They're coming in with, with these chronic diseases. And what's made worse is they go to a rheumatologist or they go to their specialist and they get given a drug to suppress a symptom. You know, the metaphor I always use, if you're driving your car and the oil light goes on, you don't just put a Band-Aid over the oil light. You see why those symptoms are happening. And we just don't, from a Western perspective, have a good understanding why these autoimmune problems are happening. So they get given, these young kids get given these toxic drugs to suppress the symptoms, which over time will cause more and more problems. So you're coming, into, you're coming into the doctor with a problem and you're not getting treated properly because you're not treating the underlying cause. So you're creating other problems and you're not really addressing what the real problem is. And what the real problem is, is probably, we're not sure, is probably related to the food and what we've done to food and how it interacts with our microbiome, with our gut. You know, we have more bacteria in our gut and we have cells in our body. And now these bacteria in our gut, I mean, most of them are actually good bacteria, are actually doing 
positive, you know, they, they, they symbi- they're living symbiotically with us. They have positive functions for us. But we once again got brainwashed by the medical system that bacteria are bad and we've got to kill them. So you have antibacterial soap. You have bacteria, you have antibiotics in, in, in a lot of the animals we eat. You, you get given antibiotic for any sniffle. So we have this, this problem where we, we don't see the... Um, the advantage of of looking after these good bacteria we kill a lot of the good bacteria with the food with the pesticides with the antibiotics and we create this imbalance in the microbiome which then creates a problem in the gut which often then triggers the inflammation and the autoimmune disease so kids are coming in because of what they've eaten then on top of that they get treated in a way that's not addressing the problem so as Wendell Berry, who everyone should know as a, a famous American farmer philosopher says, people are fed by the food industry that, makes, that pays no attention to our health and treated by the health industry that pays no attention to our food. Now that is a crime. This is crazy that this is happening. So we have this next generation of kids. You know, we sort of a little bit older. We're not suffering 40, 50, 60s you know, we're a little bit older, but we have these next generation, our our next, our youth, our next generation are suffering from problems that are induced by what we as a culture are doing. It's crazy. Sorry, I can go on. I better stop. Well, no, so I want to jump in because I think one of the first indicators that a lot of people may not be aware of is that our skin can tell us what's going on. And what something that I learned from you and others was that your skin is your largest organ. And so if your skin is all of a sudden covered in eczema or covered in acne, it's reacting to something and it is telling you something. You know, it's kind of this red flag that's going off. And as I learned that, I thought, okay, if that's happening on my largest organ, what's happening inside that I can't see? And if my skin is sending out this warning bell, you know, sounding this alarm, what is it that I can't see that's happening on the organs on the inside? And so, you know, I think eczema is a great example of what you're talking about, where people just, they see this reaction on the surface, they code it, you know, in some cases, especially with the children. I mean, one of the boys, there was a cream that had a black box warning on it for eczema. And I thought, why didn't anyone ever suggest a diet modification in this case? And I think you speak to that so directly. I mean, there are three things that you always recommend if somebody's dealing with gut issues or kind of these chronic autoimmune issues or things that are kind of this inflammatory stuff happening on the skin. I'd love it if you could just sort of highlight some really simple steps, you know, that you, that you can take that really can begin to help you connect the dots between what you eat and how that happens on the inside to present on the outside on the surface. Right. Well, one of the most important lessons I learned early on in Chinese medicine was that a symptom is some sort of a symptom is a sign of some imbalance in the system. So you got to, You don't suppress a symptom. You see why someone has a symptom. So whether it's eczema or arthritis or any problem, you need to see what is the underlying imbalance or what's the underlying problem. So when I see eczema or when I see a lot of these inflammatory conditions, because the inflammation can present anywhere, skin, joints, heart, um, bones, anywhere, it's usually a function of a microbiome that's out of whack. And I've become so obsessed with this because I see how if you can change, if you can see your microbiome as how do you feed, how do you help the good guys and how do you uh, kill or, or I hate the word kill, but how do you get rid of the bad guys? So a lot of it has to do with food. Eat food that a lot of these these, these uh, good bacteria are used to eating. Eat a lot of plant foods. Eat the stalks and the stems because that's they like the fiber. You know, don't, you know, try avoid the pesticides and the chemicals, and I'll, you know, give ewg.org a plug, not because um, Ken is here, but they're, they're 15, you know, the, the um, what do you call it, your dirty dozen and your clean 15. Is What a great list. How helpful is that for, for when you're going to the supermarket for the dirty dozen, you avoid those those foods because they have the most pesticides on it. And then if, if you don't want to buy organic, you can't afford it. You, you, you know, the clean 15 are better to buy. So try buy organic as much as possible. Know your source of, of, of your animal protein in particular, because those are otherwise given antibiotics. So try eat grass fed meat, organic chicken. Um, and, you know, I, I think we should talk about this glyphosate, you know, not only GMOs, but glyphosate roundup is a huge, huge, problem. And I think 
Ken, and I know we've spoken about this, and Robin. I mean, this glyphosate to me is like something that no, not too many people know enough about, but I think it's probably in, in the realm of sugar and bad oils. And I think it's a huge problem that we're not addressing. So I'm going to jump in on that because as a mother, you know, you're always advised to keep pesticides and things out of the reach of children. And early on as a young mother, you know, you learn quickly what you're supposed to keep out of the reach of children, what things are not supposed to ever be under your kitchen sink. And one of those things is Roundup. And it's a weed killer that we often most frequently have known for using on the weeds in our yard. I think what few realize, but a lot of people are learning, is that with the introduction of genetically engineered crops in the 1990s, the company that made Roundup, that was their top selling product. It was a revenue driver like nothing else for that chemical company. What they were able to do is genetically engineer seeds so that those seeds could withstand increasing doses of that Roundup. And they actually called the seeds Roundup Ready Soy and Roundup Ready Corn because those seeds were ready to receive increased up, you know, doses of this Roundup weed killer. And those are genetically engineered crops, also known as GMOs. And so what we're seeing now is, you know, in the introduction of these GMOs in the 1990s, it does correlate almost directly with this massive uptick we've seen in food allergies, an incredible increase in the autoimmune diseases, but the industry will quickly re reply, you know, correlation is not causation. And that is true. As an analyst, I was in finance, that's true. However, a correlation of that magnitude merits investigation. And I think the only way that we can do that is with labeling and measuring and traceability and accountability. And as we've discussed, and this is absolutely Ken Cook's work, is you know, the EPA and the USDA stopped counting the application of glyphosate to our food crops. They stopped measuring how much of this Roundup is actually on the food that we eat. And if you think about it, you know, the very thing that we're told not to store under our kitchen sink is actually going on our dinner table, on our lunch table, and on our breakfast table every single day without our knowledge. And so I do want to turn to Ken now because, you know, one of the things that was the most powerful in the early years of my work was turning to the environmental working group and realizing that Ken had built out these databases of not only, you know, the, the levels of pesticides that were being applied to the crops, but what was fascinating to me as a finance person was that he had also measured the money that had gone into this. And Ken, that is, uh, your, your, the systems that you have put in place, these databases that you've built out over the last several decades, continues to evolve. And I would love for you to really kind of dive into this a little bit and speak to the incredible importance of knowing how our food is made and how the science is funded. Well, thanks, Robin. It's, and it's great to be on with you and with Frank, uh, you know, to pick up uh, on on something uh, you pointed out, Frank, you really, you can treat the symptoms, uh, but to understand the causes is really the power. And that's true in understanding how agriculture works as well. Um, farmers in many cases in the Midwest find that they have limited choices right now for switching away from some of these uh, really worrisome weed killers, uh, insecticides, fungicides, collectively they're called pesticides. Uh, they don't have as many options as they might like and over time the options have narrowed and in fact the, the corporate control of those options has also narrowed. Uh, it looks as though uh, we'll be seeing a, a merger before too long between um, Monsanto and, and Bayer the German company uh, to bring together and become the most uh, powerful uh, uh, and uh, controlling pesticide company on the planet. But, but um, to go back to the, to the causes, um, uh, underneath a lot of this, we, we have an agricultural system that's very heavily oriented toward using chemical control of all kinds of pests. We've recently learned, and this goes to Frank's observation, that uh, glyphosate uh, is contaminating a, a significant amount of the food supply. We found it in a whole bunch of wines in California. It has been found in, in uh, wheat uh, and uh, edible beans and other crops in the United States and Canada. Uh, unfortunately, the Department of Agriculture has not been vigilant in protecting us by taking the very first step and looking to see if these weed killers and other uh, pesticide substances are in food. Uh, once they do that, they, we begin to see that the contamination is, is fairly common and fairly widespread. And that means that 
uh, even if you're eating a, a crop like a, a wheat crop, wheat-based food like bread, you might end up with glyphosate in your food, even though uh, wheat has not been brought to the marketplace yet at, at, in a uh, Roundup ready form, but farmers are using it in the fields to um, assist in the, the harvest of, of, of wheat crops. And so they spray it on the grain late in the growing process. And as a consequence, you end up with that residue. Uh, so it, as, a, as an aid to farming, it's causing this exposure that uh, the Department of Agriculture and the Environmental Protection Agency haven't really taken full account of yet. In Europe, they were aware of this happening and they've, uh, they've begun to uh, take steps to uh, reduce the use and exposure of glyphosate. We haven't done that here. That's true of dozens and dozens and dozens of other chemicals in agriculture. It's true of chemicals in personal care products. Robin's point about the, uh, the, the skin being the largest organ. Uh, a lot of the personal care products, you can go to our website, Skin Deep, and uh, we're focused on food today, but another route of exposure for many of these chemicals is what you put on your skin as personal care products. Uh, and when, when you see a rash, when you see uh, some sort of reaction on your skin, it's very common for people to experience that with certain personal care products, right? It's an allergic response. That should tell you that this is a biologically reactive substance you're putting on. It doesn't maybe affect everyone. You may be distinctly different than 95% of the rest of the population. But for you, it's important. And so what it comes down to in many cases is thinking through and going back to basics and trying to reduce exposures wherever you can to these chemicals. Because class by class, whether it's pesticides that are relatively heavily scrutinized and regulated to personal care product ingredients where there's essentially no pre-market review, uh, across the board, we don't pay enough attention to the scientific review of the health of these substances. We only look at them when we do look one at a time. So you may be finding that you're, you're exposing yourself to many different chemicals that could affect your immune system, uh, could uh, be associated with cancer or nervous system problems. Many, many chemicals in our bodies uh, that we know from EWG's own blood testing, it's showing up in people. And we never test these chemicals in combination. We almost we do a very poor job testing some of them individually. So you, you're constantly going back to the, to the, to the basic precept. Uh, less exposure is better, eating lower on the food chain with, with, with fewer uh, opportunities for exposure to, to chemicals or pollutants that might get into food, like it gets, can get into meat, uh, get into dairy products, is, is the way to go. And I think that that's, that's one step you can take to make sure that your diet is not uh, a source of exposure to toxic chemicals. So, you know, listening to you, Ken, I think about the science, you know, and the industry will come out and say there are thousands of studies proving that this is safe. And, you know, we really are in a place that is very, very similar to what happened with the tobacco industry. And it's, it's often referred to as tobacco science because you had this he said, she said, scientific debate, depending on who was funding the studies. And we're very much in that same place right now with a lot of the applications, pesticides, and chemicals that are being used on our, on our food system. You make a really, really important point, which is when these things are tested, they're tested in isolation one by one by one. And generally, the tests are conducted in a way that it's sort of measured on an average man. And so, you know, again, as, as, as Frank was talking about, you know, he's seeing young women, and we are seeing just epidemics in children today in the United States. And so we don't know what actually is happening when it impacts a four-year-old little boy or a pregnant mother. And then on top of that, the other concern is, and I mean, I would, I would bet that most people did this in some high school biology or chemistry class where you have two different beakers of two different materials and you hold them side by side and they're totally fine, nothing happens. But when you combine them together, that synergistic toxicity creates a reaction that didn't create in isolation. And again, to speak to the fact that now we are really on this kind of treadmill of, of pesticides, this increased uptick. And the, those measurements that were being calculated were coming from places like the USDA. I mean, the USDA said, you know, with the introduction of GMOs, we suddenly see this uptick in glyphosate. So you step back and the farmers are saying, you know, it's not working. And now the weeds have developed a resistance to Roundup. Yeah. And some of the farmers are saying, you know, not only are we having to use more toxic, higher doses, you know, of different chemicals, 
on our farms, but in some cases, the farmers are saying, you know, these, these weeds have become so resistant that it is impacting farm equipment, it's impacting tractors, some of the wheels that they've been using, they've had to switch out, you know, so farmers are really in this place right now where I think they, um, they're struggling. And I hear that all the time. And they often feel that they're in the crosshairs. And I think it is really important for the farmers that are listening today to understand that the consumer wants to work with you. That you're trying to figure out a solution that's safe for your family and our family. And the choices you guys have on the farm are the choices we have at the farmer's market, at the grocery store, and for our own families. And I think this treadmill, um, I'm wondering if you could speak to that. And I think, you know, in your, in your work, the way that you have built out these databases allows those numbers to speak for themselves. And I think it is critically important that we really look at what is happening here in the United States, the fact that we spend more on healthcare than any other country on the planet, that we have these sort of lower thresholds that we've allowed, you know, not only with all the artificial ingredients and pesticides that are allowed into our food, but you know, you turn to Europe and like you're talking about cosmetics. I mean, it's something over 1100 ingredients that have been banned in Europe. And I think in the US we're at like 30. So, you know, again, as consumers, that information can be paralyzing and it can just feel like this tsunami that's hitting you and you just don't even know where to begin or what to do. And I think it is so important that we really recognize that none of us can do everything, but all of us can do something. And so, you know, you touched on it briefly, Ken, I think by definition, USDA organic, when you see that seal right now, by definition, that means that those crops were produced without the use of genetically engineered seeds and without the use of these synthetic pesticides like Roundup. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. I mean, you're based, you know, your organization is based in DC and the work that's gone into creating that standard and how critical it is now as we move forward. Well, it really is important. I mean, organic is not a perfect standard. Uh, as we all know, there are many things about it that, that people have raised questions about. But um, from my standpoint, that, that's, that's what I feel comfortable feeding my kid, who will be nine in June, Robin, if you can believe it, little cow. Um, but, but, you know, the, the, real, the real issue I think that we face is we need to rebuild our food system. Uh, we need to take steps as consumers to help farmers do that by voting with our dollars. Uh, the reason we built these databases uh, so that you can shop for fruits and vegetables, even if you can't find or afford, afford organic, we have our, our shopper's guide to pesticides and produce. You can buy the Clean 15, even if they're not organically grown, dramatically reduce your pesticide exposures over the course of a year by organic where you can uh, for certain crops where it's especially important. Um, same with personal care products. And we've built these things because the regulatory system's broken. Uh, it's broken partly by design. I think a, a lot of good intentions behind it at the time, perhaps Congress enacted a law to clean up drinking water, clean up pesticides and food and so forth. But uh, there's so much money uh, in the system, so, so awash in special interest investments, and they invest in science that goes their way. They invest in lobbyists, uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars spent on lobbying every year, um, hundreds of millions of dollars spent on campaign contributions. And all of this is designed uh, to try and preserve the, the rights not of people uh, necessarily, but the rights of, of chemicals in our system to keep them uh, in production as long as possible so that the companies that have invested in their production and their use uh, can enjoy that investment. As a, as a financial analyst, Robin, you know how this business model, model goes. You, you strike an invention, you, you, you issue a product, it might be a pesticide that's used on food, it might be a, a personal care product ingredient that's used in skin lotion, uh, you want to keep that uh, production line going as long as you can and amortize that investment until it, you know, you've, you've really cleared all your profits out of the system. Uh, that, that has uh, profound effects. And fortunately now in the, in the era of the internet, and we're well into this era, uh, it's much easier to get information. We have people coming to our website, thousands and thousands every day, and they, they're shopping smarter as a result of it. And they're going to Frank Lipman. Uh, and people who practice medicine the way Frank practices medicine, and they're getting this guidance that helps them avoid these toxic exposures and shift their 
their eating habits, their, their personal habits in, in ways that don't require you to leave uh, your home and live in a yurt in a mountain pasture yeah. and, uh, and, and never be around civilization again. You can simplify a lot of uh, routines, a lot of exposures. And you see this in the food industry too, right? Robin, I mean, the, the, the clean label approach that many companies are taking now, they're trying to get rid of certain ingredients in, in food products because consumers have said, do we really need this? Or is this an aid, uh, a convenience to bakers or to people uh, manufacturing uh, processed soups or what have you? And in many cases, that is true. So uh, labels are getting cleaned up in food service establishments, in the grocery aisle. Uh, well, that should tell you something that the direction of, of making things simpler reducing those exposures makes all the sense in the world. Well, you know, and again, I think if you think about what Frank is seeing in his practice and literally pediatricians around the country are seeing, so much so that the American Academy of Pediatrics actually had to issue a statement paper on organics. And I can guarantee it's because moms were walking into that office and they were asking questions and the doctors didn't have a statement on hand. And if you think about this, if you think about pediatricians that were in medical school maybe 30 years ago, that was well before the introduction of GMOs. That was well before the National Organic Standard Board, you know? And so we really are on new terrain when it comes to our food system. And as you discussed, unfortunately, these agencies that we thought were in place to protect and ensure the health of the country are protecting and ensuring the health of the corporation. And that's, I mean, that is smart business, you know, to really kind of co-opt an agency, use it as a marketing arm, that's smart business. What's fascinating to me right now is that the marketplace is moving in another direction. You know, these companies, these big companies, like General Mills, like Kellogg with their Kashi division, they're starting to say, you know what, our consumer wants free from food. Costco has expanded and just exploded in revenue by offering organic selections. Mm -hmm. Kroger is another extraordinary example. In 2012, that team launched its Simple Truth product line, which meant it was free from artificial ingredients, free from things like GMOs. That went from zero to 1.7 billion in revenue by 2016. The CEO recently said on an earnings call, it was the bright spot in their earnings. And so as the market is shifting, in a way, those agencies almost become obsolete because the corporations are saying, you know what, this is where the money is. So how do we build out our supply chain? And again, I think what's fascinating is this partnership that you're starting to see between practitioners like Frank. And so, you know, when you walk into a doctor's office, if there's somebody who is educated in the last decade and isn't relying on an education from 30 or 40 years ago, they're right there with you as a partner saying, you know what, you are smart to be removing things like glyphosate from your diet because the World Health Organization declared it a probable carcinogen. Not because anybody said it, not because you heard it on the internet, because the World Health Organization has said, this is a probable carcinogen in humans. And as you can look around the world, you realize that other countries have opted out and they have taken a much more preventative stance in protecting the health of their consumers. And I think what we can do is partner with our practitioners, pediatricians, Dr. Lippman and others, and really form a team that's like, okay, you know, we're gonna be in here together on the ground, figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And I think where we are today with the rates of allergies and autism and diabetes and cancer is that diet is no longer one size fits all. And if we went around right now, I bet, you know, 30 years ago, we all probably ate a pretty similar meal over Thanksgiving and today there's no way. I mean, people are dealing with all kinds of different allergies, diabetes, you know, some are sensitive to food dyes, some are sensitive to other things. And it really has created this need for specialized dietary advice. And so, you know, Frank, I really want you to kind of get into that because even as you see these numbers go up kind of in general as a whole in your practice, I'm sure that at the patient level, there's so many different things that are going on. And one of the things that really struck me when I first met you in your offices in New York was, you know, you said dairy-free, gluten-free, and sugar-free. And I think the sugar-free thing is also something that Ken has touched on in one of his databases with the cereals, where, you know, there are a lot of ways that inflammation in a system is triggered. And I think sugar can get a pass, but even organic sugar is still sugar. And I would love for you to sort of speak to a little bit what sugar can do in a system and why you see that as so important. 
Right. Well, I, as I always say, sugar is the devil. But I think there are more and more devils now. I think when I first started out, it was sugar, and then you realize it's gluten, and then you realize maybe dairy. And, and the more I do it, the more I'm realizing there are more and more foods that seem to trigger problems with people. You know, now I'm seeing more and more grains. Of, you know, now uh, uh, if I, a typical or the most common diet I, I give to people is no beans, no grains, um, no sugar. So I've got, seems to get stricter and stricter, not because uh, I'm necessarily against those foods, but I think as, as Ken pointed out, is it the glyphosate on these foods? I mean, why are these foods just causing problems? I'm, I'm putting people on these diets because I see them a couple of weeks later, they come back and they feel better. So there's something that's being done to our food that wasn't being done 20 years ago because those same foods were not causing problems. So something that's been done to the food. There's also, I think, you know, this microbiome story. There's something that's been done to our, you know, internal microbiomes that's affecting the way these foods are processed. And, you know, and, and the other point is there's something that's been done to the soil microbiome. There's a microbiome of how that food is grown and if you're putting all pesticides and chemicals into that soil, you're obviously going to affect the microbiome of how you grow the food. So that's very complicated. And what I love about the growth of the organic food movement is that's going to create healthier soil, which is ultimately going to create healthier food. So it's really interesting what's happening. And, and as you point out, this is a consumer-driven movement. The more we buy organics, the more farmers are going to plant organic, the healthier the soil is going to be. So it's a, it's, it's a wonderful thing to see. So to answer your question, um, sugar, I mean, I think sugar is interesting because, um, you know, sugar, what sugar does metabolically to our body is, is, you know, first of all, it creates this whole insulin response, which then triggers the body to store fat and all, and, and all sorts of things. But sugar also, you know, sugar is, is often half fructose. And when I talk about sugar, to me, fruit juice is sugar, you know, uh, a lot of the cereals is sugar and, and a lot of that sugar or fructose goes directly to the liver and can't get processed. So we're seeing more and more of these kids with fatty liver disease. I mean, we never saw that 10, 15 years ago. You're seeing young kids with fatty livers. That's sort of a precursor to liver disease or even cirrhosis. And that's because of the amount of fructose and sugar that we are consuming because sugar is everywhere. It's not just the sugar you put in your tea. It's all the fruit juice. It's all that processed foods with sugar. And as Ken pointed out, I think it's a combination of all the chemicals as well. It's not just the sugar. It's all the chemicals in the food. It's, you know, and it's probably also the lack of sleep and, and um, you, you know, uh, the, 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 the way we live our lives. But for the most part, I think sugar is one of those chemicals or, or toxins that one can remove as much as possible from our diet because metabolically it causes havoc in the body. You know, as I listen to you, I think about, so again, having been an analyst covering, covering the food industry and these beverage giants like Coca-Cola, I mean, soda sales have been in a death spiral for probably over a decade. And these companies now are figuring out, oh, do we buy the kombucha company? You know, Pepsi just bought a kombucha brand. Do we expand into water? You know, what do we do? What do we do? Um, you know, they kicked it over and instead of having the full sugar soda, you can have the diet soda, which, you know, when you start putting aspartame into somebody, you know, and that was first introduced in the 1990s, again, you know, the, the FDA saw more complaints on that one ingredient than anything else that they ended up shutting it down. They shut down their ability to receive those complaints. And so again, you know, we step back and we say, what's going on? And I think when you look at the science, you've got to see what science is for sale. And I think that industry has been notorious at funding the science. You know, Coca-Cola got slapped last year because they were funding scientists out here in Colorado. They were funding the obesity studies. Well, Monsanto's done the same thing. You know, when they're studying GMOs and glyphosate on food allergies, you know, Monsanto's funding some of those studies too. And I think you've really got to step back and you've got to say, is the science for sale? How do we as consumers and practitioners make sure that the science that we're getting is credible? And I think most importantly, the beauty of science is that it's always changing. So how do we stay current to the science? And I think what we're seeing in the health of our families right now, that is just the canary on this thing. You know, we've got to be paying attention. Seven out of 10 kids in the United States don't qualify 
to serve in the military. One of the reasons for that is because of the incredible use of drugs in this generation of kids that have earned them the title of Generation Rx. Another is because of the rates of obesity. And so, you know, this really quickly becomes a national security issue. And I think, how do we combine with each other? How do we lean on resources? How do we find a practitioner that's gonna say, you have to work with this? And one of the things that you just said that I think is truly so inspiring is that as you make a dietary change and a modification, how quickly you can see that start to play out. And really, you know, I'll tell people too, it's usually within a couple of weeks, you can start to see the impact. And I'm wondering if you can talk to that just a little bit, that you know, you're not asking people to try something for six months, that usually within a couple of weeks, they're gonna to start to understand what you're talking about. No, exactly, and, and that's the, the beauty of, you know, what I learned very quickly is if you can make someone feel, you know, I don't see kids, so it's hard to say, but I know with kids as well, just in two or three weeks, they're gonna feel much better by changing their diets. But what I learned early on is if you can get someone to feel better quickly, then you've got them hooked. If someone comes in and they want to lose weight or they've got belly problems or they've got headaches or they're tired, if you can get them to feel quickly within you know, a week or two weeks, you've got them hooked. And it's actually when you change someone's diet, when you get them off the foods that may be harming them and you get them to maybe sleep better, to exercise, but predominantly, you know, we start with a diet. When you get someone to change your diet, it's very rare that within two weeks they're not going to feel a difference. And that's, uh, that's very quick. So that's the beauty of our bodies. Our bodies are, are pretty incredible that they can respond so quickly to these changes because most of the time we've been abusing them for so long with so many things and you clean someone's diet up for two weeks, they generally feel much better. So it doesn't take a long time. Now, if you have an autoimmune disease, sure, it's going to take months and months to completely heal. But to get someone to feel better quickly is you know, 10 days, two weeks. So it is relatively easy if someone's prepared to make those changes. You know, once you have that internal uh, kind of awakening and awareness to that shift, you really are, then you really, you realize what it feels like to feel good. And I think for so many of us, and I was one of these people, I, I didn't know what it felt like to feel good. I was just popping in acids and you know, all kinds of medications to try to, to, try to band-aid everything. And it wasn't until the diet modification that I understood that it was truly, you know, that it was healing from the inside out. Right. And I think, you know, Ken, your work has been so fundamental in this. And I, I think about, you know, the most recent list of the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15, the one that rose to the top this year, which was different, was spinach. And one of the things that struck me was that, you know, here we are thinking spinach. And this, this is where the tug of war comes in is because, you know, of course we want people getting more fruits and vegetables in them. Uh, you know, of course we want people choosing real food over the fake food and the processed food that's in the middle of the grocery store. But then to realize that, that the way that we grow spinach in the United States allows for the application of, of pesticides and some of these things that, that aren't even allowed in other countries. You know, again, I get back to, this becomes a competitive issue for us globally because not only are we producing food that may be making us sick, but we're also producing food that the rest of the world doesn't want to buy. And, you know, that comparison of, you know, we really have become a standard that few people want anymore, I think speaks to the opportunity in front of us to really raise the bar. And as we do, it not only protects the health of our families, but it also protects the financial health of farmers. It grows our farm economy because here in the U.S., less than 1% of our farmland is organic. So we're importing something like 70% of organic soy that we need. We're importing it from other countries rather than growing it here in the United States. And those are huge opportunities for our Midwest, our farmers, our farm economy. And then it also, as we spoke to earlier, makes it easier for companies like Costco and Kroger and Safeway that are really trying to offer more organic produce to offer it at a price that makes it affordable and accessible. And so, you know, I'm wondering in your work over the years with that Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15, I'm sure you must have seen so many times over where we are using these substances that are just flat out banned around the world. No, that's exactly right, Robin. Uh, the, the, just a couple of quick points. You, you, you really hit on something very important with respect to organic. Um, I spoke to a, a company the other day. You would recognize them in a moment, but I don't want to mention their name just now. 
uh, out of uh, respect to the conversation we had, but they, uh, they, they use figs for their products and they're, uh, they're organic, uh, an organic company by and large, but um, in order to get organic figs, they have to go to, to meet the supply needs they have. Uh, they, um, they have to go to Turkey. And I'm not, this is saying nothing critical of uh, Turkish figs, but it's crazy that uh, we're not growing those here in California and earning that revenue here. We should be exporting organic figs uh, as Turkey is. So, you know, we're, we're, we're out of touch economically on some of these markets. And I think it's starting to shift back. I think people are starting to realize that. Um, and the second thing, uh, just to go to something Frank mentioned, um, you, you know, um, we don't tell people at EWG that if you want to change your life to become uh, more sustainable in terms of the environment and healthier in terms of your personal life, we don't say to people, you know, step number one is put solar panels on your roof and buy a Tesla. Uh, we, we, we don't expect that people can take giant leaps like that. We tell people, look, uh, when you're shopping in the grocery store, make some modest changes, a few categories at a time, uh, start uh, feeling some sense of, of winning, of, of uh, small wins that can support these positive habits that then begin to form. And you see, you see the, the progress in your health. Uh, you're contributing uh, environmentally by supporting with your dollars uh, organic farmers, uh, mostly in the United States, we hope, but over time even more. Uh, than we see now. It's about a $44 billion industry right now, organic in the United States, much bigger than it was just a few uh, years ago. And that's because consumers can't quite get enough of this organic food. And we need the prices, the real prices to come down, it needs to be much more available, much more democratic and accessible uh, uh, from the standpoint of uh, uh, people being able to find it and, and afford it. But uh, the combination of the steps you can take that are pretty straightforward, uh, that uh, usually don't cost a lot of money if you're smart about it, you, you, can, you can shop smart for organic and uh, shop smart for conventional and reduce your exposures tremendously and get rid of the excess sugar. I mean, we, we rated uh, something like 80,000 food products, looked at their ingredients on our food scores website recently, one of the databases you were mentioning, Robin. And, uh, you, you can't believe uh, processed meats have sugar in them. Oh, yeah. all, all kinds of crazy stuff. Well, you can just you can you can start shifting uh, category by category. Uh, finish what's in your refrigerator if you unless you have an, a, an acute problem, you know. And then as you're as you're replenishing, restocking, buy smarter. And the same dynamic can happen in agriculture. We can start converting more and more of our land to organic. We can start getting rid of the toxic load that the farmers first feel because they're, they're loading up those spray tanks, right? They're spraying the chemicals on their own property and their own communities. Uh, when they start cutting back on those exposures, that's good for them, good for where they live and for their families. And it's going to translate into cleaner food that comes to us. Uh, this is all very doable. And I think if we all put our minds to it, we can all contribute. Now, I have to put in a, a plug, though. There aren't many doctors like Frank Lipman. Uh, many of the doctors uh, out there now, even if they've been trained relatively recently, don't talk about diet. They don't talk about food as part of your, your medical uh, intervention, whether it's a, an annual checkup or, or something that uh, might come up that's, that's more urgent. Either way, it's very still rare to have a medical professional who takes diet that seriously. And just like, um, as Wendell Berry observed, um, it's also true. If you look at uh, great docs out there now, like Frank Lippmann, they're talking about food, and you talk about great chefs, they're talking about health. So things are starting to move in the right direction, but uh, we, still don't, we still don't have enough of this embedded into the culture and into the mainstream, uh, which is where it needs to be. You know, you make a really good point, and I do think what we're seeing is that doctors that have young children themselves that are paying attention to the conversation for a very personal reason are usually more open to the conversation. They've done some of the research themselves for their own children. What's fascinating um, that I'm hearing from these global food companies is that when they make these acquisitions of companies like Annie's, um, they're so relieved. They say, you know, their wives will then say, oh, now we don't have to hide the fact that we buy organic. And I think when you look at the partnerships between companies like General Mills and Organic Valley recently announced to help convert 
farmland to organic acreage. I mean, that's something that five years ago would have been unprecedented. There's no way we would have seen something like that. Costco CEO telling his shareholders, we're going to be working on the supply chain. We're going to be working on converting farmland. So there are conversations that are happening now that, that five years ago, there's no way they would have happened. What the farmers are then seeing is, you know, what we're hearing from the farm, the farm farmers are saying they're hedging. And I think that's smart. You know, instead of being all in on this chemically intensive operating system that's GMOs, they're starting to say, okay, we are going to start to grow some organic. We're going to hedge our own portfolio. And I know personally, I'm named after a farmer. She's my godmother. She lost her husband when they were in their 40s. She farmed using glyphosate because she felt she had to. She battled breast cancer. One of the girls had cancer. And it wasn't until that World Health Organization declaration two years ago in 2015 that she said, okay, I've got to find a better way. And I truly think right now, it's an all hands on deck time. We need all of these minds at the table. We need minds like Dr. Lippman. We need these farmers at the table because you can't do this in isolation. We can't come up with some solution over here that actually doesn't really work over here. And I think the consumer has so much power. And every time you go into a grocery store, every time you see a product offering that suddenly there's more organic, you know, the power of thank you is incredibly strong. And you can thank those store managers, you can thank the brands as they start to make these shifts because what we are realizing is that the food system from the 20th century cannot feed 21st century families. We are too allergic, we're too diabetic, we're battling too many autoimmune conditions and too many diseases. And we need food that's free from a lot of these ingredients that we've been using in the 20th century. And in that, there is just an extraordinary opportunity for innovation, for creativity, and for collaboration. And to me, that's what makes the industry so exciting right now, as it truly is an all hands on deck time. And I think with this merger of Monsanto being acquired by this German company, it opens up an opportunity for us to get really creative and innovative and come up with solutions that work not only for 21st century families, and farmers, but also for 21st century food companies. And I truly believe there's nothing more patriotic that we could be doing. So, you know, as we kind of, as we, as I think through this as a wrap up, um, I know when I first learned this, it was paralyzing. I just thought, you know, my entire kitchen is full of this stuff. It's artificial. It's got GMOs. It's got all this stuff. And what do I do? And where do I start? And I've got these four little kids. And I thought, okay, I cannot make the perfect the enemy of the good. I can do one thing. And for us, you know, we kind of decided to go out at one thing a month. And where we started was the products that we consumed the most. And I think, you know, that's where your Dirty Dozen list is incredible, Ken, because it's like if your family's big on consuming spinach or big on consuming apples, whatever that one thing is, maybe it's milk, you know, you make sure that that's the thing that you go organic on first. And then you can begin that conversion and you begin that education. So, you know, Frank, I would love for you to sort of, as a takeaway, you know, what would you suggest to those that are watching us today? Well, I always suggest eat as close to nature as possible. I have this motto, if it's made by God, it's probably good. If it's made by man, be careful. So mm -hmm. I encourage patients to, um, and, and my readers to sort of know the source of their food, sort of, you know, know your farmer, get, you know, try shop at farmer's markets. Start speaking to the farmers and encouraging them. And, you know, once they get to know what, what you know, their, their clients' needs are, they're also going to plant healthier food. So shop at farmers' markets. And just do your best. You, you know, it's, it's not just sugar. It's, it's, it's looking at, you know, EWG, you know, your, 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 your lists are very helpful. Um, you can't go crazy. You can't get neurotic and, and anxious about it because that'll, you know, that's going to make you sicker. But just be practical. Um, but as much as possible, know the source of your food. That's great advice. And then Ken, you know, I mean, I think there's so many resources that the environmental group offers. What one thing would you suggest to those watching today? Well, I, I would say we want people to eat fruits and vegetables, no matter what conventional or otherwise, it's healthier for you than uh, eating a bunch of processed foods. But I, I think our shopper's guide to pesticides and produce, it's our dirty dozen, the, the, the the fruits and vegetables that we find to have the most pesticides in them, you looking at government data and the clean 15, uh, they can be produced, uh, those crops conventionally, but because of the timing of pesticide application, the types of pesticides used and so forth, 
uh, they're, they're very low in pesticide residues by the time they reach consumers. But pick one thing at a time. I mean, you, you're exactly right, Robin. Um, uh, you know, do something that's going to make you feel successful. Um, make you feel like you're you're on a winning streak, and uh, that that might mean just making some slight changes in the produce uh, aisle. Uh, more and more choices available in large grocery stores now, organic than than were before. Uh, things like potatoes and carrots and uh, uh, even spinach. Obviously, fresh uh, fresh uh, lettuce. Uh, all of these are a significant portion of the produce supply now is organic because of what consumers have done and what, how farmers have responded. So I think it's, I think it's really important to, uh, to, 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 to be successful, feel successful, and move on to your next win from there. That's great advice, and I wish I had heard that over a decade ago when I was starting because I thought, you know, I can't do everything. Should I just not try? But I think it is so important to start now to not make the perfect the enemy of the good, to really, like you say, focus on progress, not perfection. But it is so important to start now. I mean, all of us have stories of friends, colleagues, you know, who waited until there was this acute diagnosis. And in my work, I've given presentations at MD Anderson down in Houston, and those doctors actually have a name for it. They call it the doorknob syndrome where a patient is in their office, they've been diagnosed, it was a head and neck cancer doctor, he said they've been diagnosed with cancer, he has them in the office going through all of the different procedures and things that, that they're going to have to go through, and the patient as he turns to go with his hand on the doorknob will turn back into the office and say, doctor what can I be doing differently with my diet, and he said I've seen it so many times that I call it the doorknob syndrome. So I would hope that after today, anyone who may have hesitated thinking they had to do it perfectly, it is so important to start now. This is not about perfection. This is about progress, not only personally for all of us and our families, but truly for our food system and for the health of our country. So to everyone that joined us today, thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate all of you being here. And to Frank and Ken, thank you so much for the extraordinary work that both of you do. I know I am so grateful, and everyone listening today is too. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, guys. You're, as always, fantastic. See you next time. Thanks. Bye.